Hunter the Left Hand Path. The hunters of the court of the seven-headed serpent are followers of the left hand path. They stalk the primordial hinterlands of hell where they hunt terrifying beasts and perform vile magics and auguries using the innards of their still living prey to discern portents and omens. They follow the hidden paths, the secret ley lines that connect the eons old shrines and ruins that still endure in the cancerous, tortured wilds of hell. The hunters haunt the remnants of kingdoms, the sites of ancient battles, and places of legends long forgotten by the scribes and cartographers of hell. In solitary rituals, the hunter makes appealing oblations before these forgotten shrines, genuflecting and making obstinance to enigmatic beings of awesome power whose names even the arch devils have forgotten. To arm themselves, the hunters perform strange rituals upon their left arm, driving into it nails of infernal iron forged into, in the foundries of the city of Pandemonium. Their left arm grows into wicked shapes, often taking the form of a powerful hunting bow that fires arrows made from the hunter's own diseased blood. Such darts can be used for many purposes, killing their prey outright, paralyzing them or causing them to see visions of their own demise. They wear the pale skins of the stargazing oracle beasts that wander the burning plains of hell in great herds. The eyes of the oracles are alive even after their death and watch out for the new master that wears their skin as a cloak. When called to war on earth, the devil lords can really only hope the hunters answer their summons as the hunters do not always listen. They prefer the solitude of the wilds of hell where they can ruminate upon its vile majesty and consider the orders from the princes of hell as suggestions at best. When one can be persuaded to join the hunt of the court on earth, they can traverse the paths of no man's land just as easily as the wastes of hell, for the ley lines of hell are reflected upon the fallen creation, allowing the hunter to move unerringly through any terrain, find perfect ambush spots, and disappear into the shadowy spaces where the barriers between worlds are weak. They are experts at hunting and capturing mortal prey and bringing them to the nobles of the hunt, or causing indescribable pain on humans that can be used to power the greatest of gothic spells. In such hunts, they carry a tormentor chain as their other weapon of choice. A wicked hook with barbed chain that extends and twists upon contact with flesh, capturing their target and ravaging them with pain, yet rarely killing them. The hunter mocks the fate of its prey while dragging it into the slavery in the court, to be used as playthings whose pain and suffering elevates the infernal magic of its new masters. The Yoke Fiends Yoke fiends are the twisted stillbirds of cursed devils, a thousand thousand generations growing ever more debased and feeble, and crossbred with beasts of the field by the sadistic infernal bio priests. These, least of all demon kin, are kept in servitude until even after the stars go out. Lacking intelligence, tortured by their own perverse existence, and filled with malice, they are fit for nothing but the crudest of tasks. In the innermost chamber of their black heart remains the tiniest polluted shard of divinity, the cruel legacy of their once angelic forefathers. This dim knowledge and their repulsive fallen state fills the yoke fiends with unending hatred and envy towards any untouched part of the creation. Throughout the endless plains of hell, yoke fiends keep the great boiling cauldrons constantly lit, feeding the fires with the damned. They gleefully throw the endlessly shrieking souls into the boiling vats of pitch, the torment of others being the sole consolation of their miserable existence. In work gangs a million strong in the vast quarries, the yoke trolls cut the ubiquitous black stone with which they erect the great towers, keeps, ziggurats and towers of hell, monuments glorifying their own bitter enslavement. Yoke fiends torment the league's long columns of the still living damned as they march into the lake of fire, whipping them incessantly with scourges fashioned from the never bundles of still conscious victims. This colossal human suffering in turn powers the goetic magic of the arch devils and their mortal servants as it disrupts God's plan for the universe. When called to war, the bellows of these brutal creatures shake the very foundation of their lord's menace. 
They are given simple but wicked weapons and they delight in the pain they inflict with them. Axes, spike clubs, curving hooks, pitchforks and even simple firearms loaded with shot of infernal iron are given to these monstrous creatures. A yoke fiend stands some 7 to 8 feet tall with layers of shivering fat and muscle branded by their masters and carved by the knives of the hell priests to mark them as property of the greater demons. They exhibit bestial features such as horns and hooves of cattle or goats, ape-like limbs with immensely dense bones. They hate seeing their own reflection as in their heart of hearts they know the beauty and glory they have lost for all eternity. The Desecrated Saints Desecrated Saints are the most prized possessions of the Lords of Hell. Men and women who once were destined to become saints, great prophets or holy ones according to God's plan, but who were led astray and fell from grace. Many of them were once righteous rulers or religious leaders dedicated to bringing prosperity and glory to their people. But pride, desperation or an eagerness to achieve martyrdom led them to commit some indiable sin or evil, often for the motives they believed to be good and pure. Some sacrificed living humans thinking it was what was demanded of them. Others carried on wars after they were commanded to stop or sought to do miracles through magic. When their deeds led to their downfall and death, they were entombed inside the holy reliquaries, only to wake in hell still encased in the shrine that has now become their prison. Desecrated saints are kept as a symbol of pride by the mighty devil lords who corrupted them. The body of the reliquary is made up of the saints' retinue in life as well as the greatest vanquished foes which are continually added to it over the eons of its existence. The husk of these devout who swore to follow their holy leaders to death and beyond form the towering body of this abomination. The remains along with their armor and weapons are tarnished and corrupted and fused together over the long millennia into a walking prison with which the desecrated saint remains conscious in death to witness the never-ending fall and cost of their folly. The accuration of corpses, weapons and relics is a testament to the power of the devil lord that controls it and there is a fierce competition between the arch devils to see whose desecrated saint displays the greatest splendor and prestige. As this walking blasphemous tabernacle vanquishes champions of of Yahweh over its eternal existence, it collects their shields and buckles to hang about its body, a mockery of the Tower of David with its thousand buckles. When the court travels to either make war or hunt, this blasphemous tabernacle often goes with them, both as terrifying battle standard but also a potent weapon of war. Due to the deviation of the saint's mission to the service of evil, a dark aura surrounds it within this area. The laws of God are perverted or cease to exist. Down is up, strength is weakness, and the strongest of shields and armor are brittle as glass. In battle it wields a variety of once holy weapons and debased relics, bringing the very power of hell on earth in a way not even the mightiest mortal heretic ever could. The Hell Knight Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Book of Ezekiel The silent battalions of hell summoned to serve when the court of the seven-headed serpent seeks sport are composed of hell knights. Their ever-burning banners stream as they march to war, carrying out the bidding of their masters. They are the bannerets of the higher lords of the court, champions who respond to foolish mortals daring to challenge the hunting parties of the serpent's nobility who embark on hunting excursions beyond the gate for their amusement. Heretic priests whisper that these infernal warriors were once lesser fallen angels or mighty mortal champions elevated into devilhood, but then cursed by their liege lords for some slight real or imagined. Cast out from the burning palace of the pit, the alabaster architecture of their bodies is now bound, twisted and folded upon itself a thousand times and encased in a tomb of their once splendid armor that is now their eternal prison. 
It is said that to glimpse the body inside is to gaze upon the sheer horror of divine flesh warped with glaring eyes of light, mouths uttering blasphemies and pulsating inner organs that gibber and shriek, crush into a space barely tent of their original form. Despite a reduction in stature, they retain their inordinate pride and brook no insolence from the wretched mortals that served them. Once party to the secrets of creation, now their minds are cloated with endless blood-red waking dreams. Their thoughts are crushed to a singular jagged prism of murderous obsession. Their form tormented by the cold of earthly realm, they are forced to endure just as humans suffer in the flames of hell. They are mighty still, but less than nothing compared to the exalted glory of their original forms. Even so, next to a mortal soldier, they are terrifying and impeccable foes. They wield ancient and wicked weapons such as grace swords, battle axes, and arquebuses, forged by the household smiths deep in the bowels of their demon lord's keep. Though the appearance of such armaments is archaic to mortals, they are easily a match for even the most advanced arms from the foundries of New Antioch or the laboratories of the House of Wisdom. On their helmets they carry the seal of the great demon spirit that they serve, and about them float eerie corpse hand candles that act as conduits to the goetic magic, the pit locust. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared for battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and the hair as the hair of women, and their teeth as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running into battle. The Book of Revelation when the court of the seven-headed serpent hunts on earth, a great pall of smoke precedes them, and lo, out of the smoke the bay and buzzing of the pit locust heralds man's doom. Some tales say that they were sealed behind the filth-encrusted bronze gates for eons beyond measure, waiting until the key that opens the bottomless pit was turned in its lock. Others say that they are the debased remnants of once proud angels. Lesser Ishim that debased themselves at the sacrificial altars of Baal or Moloch and gorged themselves on the blood of the children offered to the graven images. In their bloodlust they forgot the hidden knowledge of the universe that was their birthright. They hunted the deep and dark places of earth until they were called forth by the great battle horns of hell. What is known for sure is that when the gates of hell opened, terrifying swarms of pit locusts appeared. They delight in tormenting mankind and are imbued with feral, cunning, and wicked bloodlust. In the first battles of the Great War, which w saw the Levant overrun in a string of great victories, the pit locusts were instrumental in scattering the formations of the humans who refused to bend the knee to the nobles of hell. As a reward for their part in the battles, the pit locusts were granted the right to hunt with the court of the seven-headed serpent and take their share, their share of spoils and gorge themselves on the vanquished. In the annals of the Great War, two mighty hegemons of the Black Grail have risen, Irencia, Erex Emperor of Pestilence, and Febris, the rotting bride of Beelzebub. Each of them was destroyed, but at an unimaginable cost to the forces of the great tyrant Yahweh, whom the Lord of the Flies seeks to overthrow. Even the great Paladin Angular, the Sword of Heaven, died confronting the might of a hegemon. With the ascension of a hegemon, the hideous power of the Black Grail is exalted. Beelzebub grows sleek and fat, and like a magnanimous king, bestows blessings and gifts upon his most favored children. Beelzebub's insidious grip over his Grail thralls greatly increases. They move with more grace, and the exalted beings of the grill opens their ruined minds, allowing them to truly witness the rotting glory of the Lord of the Flies, and enabling them to understand more complex weaponry. In turn, the nobles that make up the ranks of the Order of the Fly are giving kingly gifts from their mighty liege. Full of the extended power of the Black Grail, how miserable they become when their hegemon lord falls in battle. Each hegemon is unique, and when slain it can never be recreated. The ecstasy of the plague knights in the service of their dread ruler sinks into the deepest despair from which there is no escape. 
The strain of the Black Grail is shunned by others of their kind and they are no longer welcome at Ekron, the city of Belzebub. They are cast out from the Order of the Fly for their failure. The hegemon strain of diseases continues to spreading and creating trolls, but they are born into a world bereft of their sires, leaving them hopeless and desolated. The eyes of the Plague Knights continuously weep cold black blood as they cry for their lost dark paradise that they will never be again. The tantalizing dream of a great flood of pestilence that cleanses the earth is lost forever. Their mournful wails echo and reverberate through no man's land, a cry of sorrow deeper than any mortal can feel, an agonizing rage of black hatred that no mortal comprehends. They compose mournful pains to their lost hegemon, beautiful yet disturbing songs that promise nothing but never-ending death. Such shattered remains of the once mighty legions of the hegemon take their vengeance on any opponent regardless of their allegiance, even throwing themselves at other black grail warbands in futile acts of regret, trying to feel pain that would at least momentarily dull their aching feelings of loss but no such hope exists in their eternal damnation. These bands made up of the strains of fallen hegemons, once mighty legions from everlasting funeral processions for their dead masters. The echo of their cries and dirges accompanies their solemn steps, taking them from nowhere to nowhere. Their eyes are forever stained by the foul tears of the black grail, and their skin turns black and slogs off, hanging in tatters like funeral garb. They seek lost artifacts in broken shards of armor and weapon of their lost liege and fashion disturbing and rusted jewelry from these remains where the hegemon's power still lingers beyond the grave. Few things that haunt the no man's land are more dangerous or more ghastly than these corruption-ridden echoes of the dark past, the funeral processions that last until time itself is no more. Auxilia Sorcerer do not turn to sorcerers or necromancers. Do not seek them out and so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. The New Orthodox Syncretic Bible. Atop tall towers clawing against the black sky of hell, the sorcerers of the court of the seven-headed serpent perform rituals and spells to advance the schemes and machinations of their lords. They meditate in the scrying chambers and the eerie sound of their insane chanting echoes throughout their lord's fiefdom. It is their ululating cries that summon their lord's warband to battle. A mighty devil lord might have thousands of sorcerers under their command. Each is formed from a tiny sliver of a fallen angel that shattered after being cast out of heaven. Not truly dead or alive, they exist at the exact moment when their original divine life ended. They have lost all the original seraphic gifts their original whole form once had, but thanks to their celestial origins, no matter how fallen and diminished, they possess the potential for channeling great power, acting as conduits of magic. The sorcerers study their secret spells of destruction and manipulation from ancient tablets found atop many peaked and unsettling mountains of hell. For just as Yahweh gave his laws atop the holy mountain, so does hell provide its power to its dark arts from the pinnacles of hell. To find the tablets, the sorcerers use blind augurs and soothsayers who wander too far to seek enlightenment and found damnation instead. After listening to the clues of their divine diviners, sorcerers study the ancient lore and ever-shifting maps of hell that fills their blasphemous libraries. When the time and place is discerned, a great expedition is mounted to discover one of these priceless tablets. It may take decades, or centuries, or even millennia to find the tablet, for time in hell flows in an uneven waves, shifting back and forth, and the wilds of hell are ever-changing and filled with many strange and deadly creatures. When the expedition reaches the appointed mountain, the sorcerer must climb to the top alone. If you manage to reach this far, please remember to like, comment and subscribe, because it helps the channel grow. Nevertheless, I'll see you in the next one. Arrivederci.